Senator Perdue, thanks for being with us. In just a few short days, millions of Americans are set to have their unemployment checks expire. This is a crisis for families all across the country. What policies need to be done to provide immediate relief for the middle class and lower middle class? Well, we just passed a $2.9 trillion relief, a relief package uh, a few months ago, and we've been implementing that. It's about half implemented right now. Um, we've also created about 7 million new jobs in the last two months. Um, the economy, as we begin the reopening, is creating jobs right now. We had a, resi we had a, uh, a hindrance to uh, people going back to work, and that was a premium on the unemployment. That expires, and I believe a lot of people will then be go, begin uh, going in and absorbing those jobs that have been created. So that's number one. Number two, we're looking at it very carefully right now. We have another phase of, of aid that we may be uh, voting on even next week. That, will, that might include liability protection, some uh, funding or reprogramming of funding for possibly our, our smallest uh, towns and communities. And then we'll look at this, we're really looking at this unemployment uh, issue very seriously. And just to follow up on that, there are also concerns that states are underfunded. When I talk to governors, for example, they're very concerned that they might have to be, they might have to start laying off or furloughing some federal and state workers. Is there any conversations that you're having that would provide some economic relief to the states in the next package? Well, I think you have to talk about states differently. It's hard to generalize about states because right. you have a group of states, small number, um, but they have been fiscally irresponsible. They've got huge retirement liabilities. And I don't think there's an appetite in the Republican caucus in the Senate anyway to uh, bail them out at using taxpayer dollars from those states who've been fiscally responsible, like my state of Georgia. In our state, we have a rainy day fund that's fully funded. Um, we have a balanced budget law, and uh, you know we don't have debt. So I mean, it's a very fiscally well-run uh, uh, state. Um, I think there's some sensitivity here, though, about small towns and communities, even in our state, that need help. They've lost revenue. Uh, they got some aid coming from the, uh, the first round of package, uh, this package, but what we've really got to work on now is giving the governors a little more latitude to get aid down to them. There's still money available for that in the first round of this. You know, the president, when he talks about economic stimulus, one of the things that he mentions is infrastructure and potentially having infrastructure sometime in September or October to have this be voted on. You've got a plan in terms of infrastructure. How, what, what's in the plan and how likely is it to garner Democratic support? Well, first of all, you know, the president actually understands that to compete globally uh, economically, we have to have a world-class infrastructure here. Georgia is very blessed with that. We have the Port of Savannah, which is the third largest port in the country, the fastest growing, the most productive port. The president's actually flying down to Georgia today to make an announcement about how he's trying to clear away. He's, he's actually changing a rule. Uh, in the uh, government to allow a quicker turnaround for approvals for new construction of infrastructure. The funding of infrastructure is the debate, right? So we've got to find a way to use public-private partnerships to get these big infrastructure projects funded. The president broke a logjam after 20 years of trying to deepen the Port of Savannah just five feet. He broke that logjam, and we now have it funded, and it will be completed in the next year or so. So he understands the importance. You can't have a world-class economy without world-class infrastructure. Are you optimistic that infrastructure could get voted on by the fall? Yeah, but it'll be the the, the structure of that is still debate uh, in debate. You know, the president wants a big, he wants to go big, and I understand that. We are trying to digest right now 2.9 trillion dollars of aid that we just approved and appropriated which added about $3 trillion to our federal debt. That's, that's something that we've got to get serious about. But I'm also considerate of the fact that we've got to make sure the economy continues to dig its way out of this um, shutdown. I mean, we shut the economy down. It's never been done before. We created 7 million new jobs in, in um, May and June. That's remarkable. It surprised everybody. If that were to continue, uh, we'll be we'll be digging out of this thing sooner than later. Let me follow up with you on infrastructure because it's not just poor, it's not just bridges, it's not just roads, right. it's not just uh, getting right. uh, cutting through regulatory red tape. It's also cyber. Yeah. You know, when you look at the developments as it relates to China and you being a member of Senate Foreign Relations, yeah. this this has to include cyber, does it not? Well, it already does. I mean, since President Trump got in office, we've been working diligently uh, to get broadband to our rural communities. America has gone through 50 years of urbanization. I think we can see some of the ills of that right now. One of the great resources we have are our rural communities. The problem is they don't have access to broadband the same way our major cities do because of the economics of it. So the government has been moving on that. The president has been uh, very supportive of that. I know the Department of Agriculture in our state has several projects that are bringing billions of dollars of, of investment to infrastructure that will bring broadband to our rural communities. So that's, 
that's a big deal. As we learned coming out of COVID, telehealth, teleeducation, all that requires a broadband in infrastructure, and that's what we're uh, focusing on right now. And just one final question. Yesterday, President Trump signed into law a, a piece of legislation with bipartisan support that would allow for uh, the U.S. to really target from a financial perspective individuals who, in the Communist Party who backed the so-called national security laws against Hong Kong. What other tools are at the United States' disposal in the short term to utilize to pressure China? This is a, uh, a, a new era in terms of uh, bilateral relationship between China and the U.S. I'm involved in that. I used to live in Hong Kong, lived in Singapore for a while, worked in China for many years. Uh, this is a complex equation. It's a great culture. It's 5,000 year uh, heritage. But uh, they've been acting nefariously here in the last uh, few decades as they've implemented the Belt Road Initiative, they're made in China 2025, they have a social credit score they've implemented on their own people. And in Hong Kong, you see that they're moving to reverse some of the individual freedoms that had been enjoyed in Hong Kong uh, all during the time that uh, the UK was in control. Actually, what China's doing right now is in violation of the agreement they had with the UK as they handed Hong Kong back over to China uh, back in 97. So this is a serious issue. Uh, I support the president, what he's doing, and this gives us an opportunity to, to deal with China uh, on some of the things they're doing to uh, reduce freedoms in places like Hong Kong. And more types of this legislation could be in the works? Well, we already have plenty of, of ways to do that right now, but yeah, there could be other legislation. But what we want to do is engage China on a level of mutual respect. I mean, that's what we've been doing in trade and, and uh, what the tra President Trump has been doing with President Xi Jinping. Uh, what we've been doing in terms of trying to uh, uh, incent them to stop the cyber war, uh, if you will, open up their markets, which they've done in the first round of our trade agreement. So we've had some monumental progress with China. We just have to get through this rough patch right now on what they're doing in Hong Kong and other places, as well as um, coming to grips with what just happened in the COVID-19 crisis. And I gotta ask, dollar peg, should, should, it, should Hong Kong's currency be pegged to the U.S. dollar? Or is, that, is that something that could be happening where we would remove that or no? Well, I think what we've done is we've taken away the, uh, the relationship in trade and finance that we've had with Hong Kong because they were more of an autonomous entity. That was the agreement with the UK. The rules and changes that have been made in those rules by China over the last uh, really couple of years is changing that autonomous nature. And so we're dealing with Hong Kong now as more of a part of China with regard to finance and, and economic issues.